November 20th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Daniel, Chapter 3 from the Old Testament. King Nebuchadnezzar had a golden statue made. It was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. He erected it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent out a summons to assemble the satraps, prefects, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other authorities of the province to attend the dedication of the statue that he had erected. So the satraps, prefects, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial authorities assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had erected. They were standing in front of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. Then the herald made a loud proclamation. To you, O peoples, nations, and language groups, the following command is given. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, trigon, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must bow down and pay homage to the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has erected. Whoever does not bow down and pay homage will immediately be thrown into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when they all heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, trigon, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and language groups begin bowing down and paying homage to the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had erected. Now at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought malicious accusations against the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued an edict, O king, that everyone must bow down and pay homage to the golden statue. When they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, trigon, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, and whoever does not bow down and pay homage must be thrown into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. But there are Jewish men, whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men have not shown proper respect to you, O king. They don't serve your gods, and they don't pay homage to the golden statue that you have erected. The Nebuchadnezzar, in a fit of rage, demanded that they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him. So they brought them before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? that you don't serve my gods and that you don't pay homage to the golden statue that I erected? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, trigon, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must bow down and pay homage to the statue that I had made. If you don't pay homage to it, you will immediately be thrown into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. Now who is that God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to give you a reply concerning this. If our God, whom we are serving, exists, he is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will rescue us, O king, from your power as well. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we don't serve your gods, and we will not pay homage to the golden statue that you have erected. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage and his disposition changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times hotter than it was normally heated. He ordered strong soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So those men were tied up while still wearing their cloaks, trousers, turbans, and other clothes and were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. But since the king's command was so urgent, and the furnace was so excessively hot, the men who escorted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were killed by the leaping flames. But those three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the furnace of blazing fire while still securely bound. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was startled and quickly got up. He said to his ministers, wasn't it three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied to the king, For sure, O king. He answered, But I see four men, untied and walking around in the midst of the fire. 
No harm has come to them, and the appearance of the fourth is like that of a god. The Nebuchadnezzar approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He called out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego emerged from the fire. Once the satraps, prefects, governors, and ministers of the king had gathered around, they saw that those men were physically unharmed by the fire. The hair of their heads was not singed, nor were their trousers damaged. Not even the smell of fire was to be found on them. Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent forth his angel and has rescued his servants who trusted in him, ignoring the edict of the king and giving up their bodies rather than serve or pay homage to any god other than their god. I hereby decree that any people, nation, or language group that blasphemes the god of Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego will be dismembered and his home reduced to rubble, for there exists no other god who can deliver in this way. Then Nebuchadnezzar promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. God, how often are we, even on a yearly basis, threatened with death in comparison to our faith? Here we have Daniel's three friends who were told, uh, dishonor your God, uh, pay homage to my God, or you will die. Uh, and they were obedient. And I think about those of us living in comfort in primary worlds like uh, the United States, and we will probably never be confronted with somebody who holds a gun to our head and says that. I know it happens in other countries, and sometimes they don't even ask, they just kill. But it's pretty rare when here in the United States, with the exception of a few times where we are actually held hostage. Um, and negotiating with our life over our belief system in you. Now with that focus in mind, what in the entire world could stop us from sharing our faith or being loud about our faith here in the United States? Our biggest fear for most of us is the fact that somebody may make fun of us, somebody uh, might not want to be friends with us anymore. Um, what will people think of us? God, I, I so apologize and ask forgiveness, beg forgiveness for how simple-minded and wishy-washy and lukewarm we are in our faith. The fact that what stops us from telling other people about you is we want to make people happy. We want people to like us. We don't want people to be mad at us. We want people to think well of us. It breaks my heart that those are some of our excuses when there's people around the world right now who are dying for their faith, who truly do have a gun point at their head and say, you either worship our God or we will kill you. And they are killed for their faith. I'm not saying that you're asking all of us to be put into that situation, but for Pete's sakes, God, we can't even master the basic piece of it. We want to please the world over pleasing you. Or we want to please you on our terms, which is kind of the same thing. We'll take all the pieces of your faith, your religious system, your relationship that you want with us, and we will pick and choose the pieces that we are comfortable with, that we want. And then we'll show you what we want in our world. We'll tell you what has to go along with that. The sheer arrogance of that statement just astounds me, yet I used to say those types of things all the time. I remember the first time I went back to church after a very long time, and I remember that list I gave you, that list of arrogance. God, I want the church to be this way, I want it to be this way, I want this to happen, I want this to happen. And while we're on the, on the list of what I want in a church, God, by the way, I also want it to be within walking distance of my house. Uh, looking back at the arrogance of telling you what my faith was going to look like and the conditions upon my faith, 
I'm not sure why in the world you even responded to me. But you did, and you responded with incredible grace and mercy and kindness. And you gave me a church and the people in the church that were exactly identical to what I'd asked for. Even down to being able to walk to it from my house. God, I didn't deserve that based upon my arrogance. But you took that moment of grace to show me you're in control of everything. You could have left me home that Sunday or you had every right to punish me for my arrogance, but you didn't. You wrapped your arms around me and you said, not a problem. If you're finally willing to go back to church now, here's the church. I have always been here waiting for you. And I am so excited that you're ready to come back. We will work on discipline later on <laughs> for what you've done. But right now, I just want you to feel the love and the grace of coming back. God, what in the world are we so afraid of, honestly, of telling other people about our faith? Why does what other people think or say to us matter so incredibly much? Obviously, way more than what you say to us. God, I don't have an answer except for our own selfishness. At least it was for me. I had no desire to be religious. I'm still not religious. <laughs> I'm just blessed I have a relationship with you. But even back then, I wanted a relationship where I told you what I wanted. There was no concern on my part except for anything and everything I wanted. The incredible selfishness of how I started my relationship with you is amazing to me. But it also shows me that anyone can start anywhere. That I can start in that incredibly selfish, selfish mode where I told you what faith was going to look like. And when I was starting out in my faith, my kingdom here on earth was gigantic. Same thing with Nebuchadnezzar, as we'll see. In this particular story, he's still at that stage where he's like, okay, your God rocks, but it's still your God. He's not quite sure about what all this looks like, and it needs to be on his terms. But one of his first terms was, nobody will ever make fun of your God. He's, he's good, but he's still your God. And King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was pretty darn big at that time. So it kind of feels a little bit like King Nebuchadnezzar was where I was at all those years ago. I even remember making fun of some of my friends who were, at the time I didn't realize it, but were truly Christians who were living that life. And I remember making fun of their life and, and what they did at church. N not to be mean intentionally. Um, it was just like the thing to do. You know, I, I went along with the world rather than what you had asked me to do. So God, I thank you so much for your grace, a grace that I have never done a single thing in my life to deserve. And yet there's so many, so many times in my life that I can pinpoint physically feeling that grace just poured out into my life. And I may not have known it at that time, just like Nebuchadnezzar probably didn't understand completely everything that was going on right then. But I'm incredibly thankful for it now. And what I pray God will happen from here going forward is that I will always remember your sovereignty and your gigantic control of everything in this world and how incredibly blessed I am. God, allow my life to reflect your glory. That is the very least I can do. And if it ever comes to a point where somebody points a gun at me and says, Tell me you don't believe in God. Then I'm okay with dying. And never turning my back on you. Because you have never turned your back on me. Your faithfulness. Especially when we don't deserve it. Is amazing. God I pray this all in your son's name. Jesus Christ. Amen.